Hello and welcome to a Talmud Israeli production. Today we'll review the highlights of this week's course of Daf Yomi study, Masechet Yivamot, pages 76 through 82, Ayin Vav through Pei Bet. 76. Vayitchaten Shlomo et Paro Melech Mitzrayim. So the Pasuk says that Shlomo married Pharaoh the king of Egypt. Now, what it actually means is he married the daughter, Bat Paro, the princess of Egypt. But the Gemara wants to know, how could it be that such a union of a Jew and an Anjou was considered a real chatunah, an actual marriage? if we have a concept that such unions are illegitimate and therefore not a reg- are not regarded as marriages. So the Gemara responds, Yara. Well, he converted her. She was Jewish and therefore a Jew and a Jew together in marriage is a real marriage. But wait a second. We have a tradition that converts were not accepted in the days of King David and the days of King Solomon, that those were especially good times, prosperous times for Am Yisrael, and that a convert is only trusted to join Judaism when we are down uh, on a low rung, and therefore it's evident that their conversion was sincere. So how could it be that the daughter of Pharaoh converted to marry Shlomo? So the Gemara answers, What was the reason for not accepting converts at that time? Only because we thought people aspired to Shulchan Malachim, to the table of the kings, to prosperity, and that's why they converted, and that would be an invalid motivation, therefore nobody was accepted. But the daughter of the king, a foreign princess, doesn't need to marry some Jewish prince or king in order to achieve material prosperity. She already has material prosperity. Therefore, her conversion would have been accepted even at a time when others would have been rejected. Ayin Zayin, 77. Any scholar who openly states a halacha, a halachic tradition, a legal tradition, uba, and then a case emerges, a practical case emerges, im kodem masa amara, shaman lo, if the statement was made before the emergence of a, of a real live case, then we'll listen to the statement and accept it as fact. Vim lavein shaman lo. However, if the real world scenario precedes the making of that statement of a halachic tradition, then we will not listen to him. Why will we not listen? As Rashi explains, Shema Mahmat Masa Evili De Amara, that maybe we're, con- we're concerned it's a fabricated halachic tradition that was concocted only to respond to a real world scenario, but is not really true. Okay. Ein Chet. Where do we find that in the Bible that Saul, King Shaul, killed the Givonim? Because the accusation is being made that uh, he did so and therefore he was got his comeuppance later on uh, during the days of David. Rather, it's not that Shaul actually killed the Givonim. Rather, it's that Shaul caused the city of Nov, the Kohanic city of Nov, to be executed. Eighty-five Kohanim were killed because they gave shelter to, to David when David was on the run from Saul. And so because the Givonim relied for their parnasa, for their livelihood, as woodchoppers and water drawers in the tabernacle, and now the tabernacle city was destroyed, it's as though Saul had killed the Givonim because he took away their, their source of livelihood. Aintet. Amar Rabbi Akiva, Siris Adam cholates v'cholotzin lishto that they shais lo shais a kosher. A Siris, a eunuch, who became that way, who lost his virility, became sterile at the hands of a person, meaning there was a surgical uh, intervention. That person can do chalitza, and if that person died, his wife can receive chalitza, because he had a shat a kosher, a time when he was uh, with his reproductive capacity before he had his unfortunate incident. Sri Shama, however, a person who was a eunuch from birth, who by God's intervention in the womb, uh, that person, Locholetz, cannot do Chalitza, Locholetz Nishto, and if he were married, his wife would not be the recipient of Chalitza. So the Gemara questions, How could it be that Rabbi Akiva says that a Sri Saddam uh, can do Chalitza, or that his wife can have Chalitza done for her, but the bottom line is, he is sterile later later in life. And at the time that he died, or at the time that he's now doing Yibum, he can't produce a child. So, Well, Rava responded, if you're going to take that approach, then there is no woman in the world who could ever be the recipient of Chalitza or do a Yibum, because 
every woman who's a widow, well, when her husband was in his last breaths in his death throes, he too was sterile. And so we obviously are going to ignore that and say that since he was uh, uh, had his reproductive capacity an hour before, or a day before, or a week before, or a month before, that means that Yibam is possible. Daf Pei, 80. Avad Rava Tosfa Uvda so, this is a really weird scenario. What happened? A man went on a journey, a business trip to a faraway place, and his wife uh, gave birth a year later before the husband came home. Now, a year later means 12 months later. An ordinary pregnancy is only nine months long. So the easy assumption to make here is that this woman committed an act of infidelity. She committed adultery because, after all, uh, nine months previously, which was three months after her husband left the scene, she must have been impregnated by another man. And yet, Achshirei, Rabbi Tosfa says, the child is kosher. We'll assume that the, the husband was the father of the baby and that the fetus stayed in a completed state in the, the mother's womb uh, longer than was usual. So, according to whom is this possible? Kerebi Damar Mishtah, according to the viewpoint of Rebbe, who says that a fetus can, even after it's done developing, remain for some stretch of time inside the mother. Pei Ein. Androgynous Kohen Shinasa Bas Yisrael. What happens if an androgynous Kohen marries a daughter of Israel? Machila Batruma, so she is allowed to eat Truma, which is typically the case when a Bat Yisrael marries a Kohen, she is allowed to eat Truma. Now, the Chidush, the novelty here is that Androgynous. We're not even sure he's a man. Maybe he's uh, some gender which is not a, not that of male, and therefore he should not be able to uh, confer eating privileges of truma upon his wife. So the Mishnah says, no, no, she could eat the truma. Well, Reish Lakish says he allows her to eat truma, but that marriage to him does not allow that woman to eat chazav ashok, uh, other Kohanic emoluments. Okay? Now, but wait a second, the Chazav Ashok emolument um, of the meat is Torah law. Truma is also Torah law. So if we're going to say that Truma becomes permitted to this woman, then Chazav Ashok also should become permitted to this woman because they're both Kohanic emoluments. So the Gemara answer is, Well, we're dealing with Truma in the post-Temple era, and Truma in the post-Temple era only is a rabbinical commandment. And by rabbinical commandment, we'll allow it even in the case of a, a marriage to an and, and, androgynous uh, Kohen, as opposed to Chaz Ashok, which is not around anymore in the post-Temple era, um, and uh, or even if, it, even if it is around in the post-Temple era, it's a Torah law, and there's no rabbinic law, so for Torah law, we would not allow that marriage to produce eating rights for the woman. Pay bit. 82. Any item which is forbidden now, but will be permitted at a later time, it has matirin, permitters, then if it, it, if, if it is mingled, mixed with other items that would render it prohibited, then even though ordinarily we would say that a mixture can be nullified, by a ratio of a majority, that uh, the forbidden minority can become disregarded in a larger permitted majority, we do not impose, we do not allow for such a rule for leniency when at some later time the whole thing will be permitted anyway. That we'll have to wait for the matirin to kick in and we will not allow bitul nullification to be applied in the here and now. Everyone have a great week.